Who doesn't love tigers? They are one of the most magnificent and powerful creatures in the world. But what does it take to protect them in the wild? Here is a classic story of several years of combined efforts of the government and the local conservation groups that protected the wild landscape and the wild tigers in India. Western Ghats in India is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Badra Kudremukh landscape forms the central part of these Ghats in the state of Karnataka. It has three protected areas that are of global importance. The Badra Tiger Reserve, the Kudremukh National Park and the Mulangiri Conservation Reserve. Like many other protected areas, these forests also faced severe pressure from humans for several decades. There was intense extraction of bamboo and timber for commercial use and two huge iron ore mines were operating in these forests. Due to these activities, the population of people also had increased in Badra from 36 families in 1915 to nearly 500 by the end of the century. Over 200 square kilometers was lost adjoining the Badra Tiger Reserve when a reservoir was constructed across Badra River in the 1960s. Clearly, these were massive challenges to be undone in the upcoming years. These issues slowly started to change with the enactment of Wildlife Protection Act in 1972 by the Government of India. It brought significant changes including prohibition of hunting of wildlife, protection of wildlife and its habitat, and regulation of non-forestry activities. Following this act, the Jagra Valley Game Reserve, which was originally a hunting ground, was combined with the adjoining forest and the present 500 square kilometers was declared as the Badra Wildlife Sanctuary in 1974. On the other end of the landscape, 600 square kilometers of mountain forest was declared as the Kudremukh National Park in 1987. By early 1990s, locals who were interested in wildlife started taking active role in the conservation efforts by defending the landscape from new threats. They were successful in stopping three new dams that were proposed inside the Badra Wildlife Sanctuary and their advocacy also ensured to end commercial exploitation of bamboo which had continued for over two decades even after the declaration of sanctuary. They formed conservation NGOs, the Badra Wildlife Conservation Trust and the Wildcatsy which eventually played a major role in the conservation success of this landscape. Considering the potential of Badra to support tigers, the government of India declared the sanctuary as Tiger Reserve in 1998. It gave a big boost to the protection efforts in Badra. During this time, the scientific institutions had recorded the presence of seven tigers in this park. A happily ever after story of Badra's wildlife and its people gained momentum with the commencement of government-sponsored voluntary resettlement of people from the sanctuary. With the painstaking effort of the Forest Department, the District Administration and the Badra Wildlife Conservation Trust, 450 families with 4,000 cattle were resettled from 13 villages inside Badra Tiger Reserve in 2003. So it's nice to see people progressing. Um, you know, when you go to the forest, you see the animal populations going up, you know, more tigers now from when it was in 97 or 96. So you see more uh, wildlife now and all the uh, uh, land that was occupied by people once is now free of people. So the entire, if you went to Badra from uh, this gate to the other gate, it's 53 kilometers. So you would see hundreds of cattle and people and disturbance and tractors. And so you, you, you only saw people mostly. Of course, there was wildlife, but you know, they were always under pressure. So, but you know, today if you drive that 53 kilometers, is nothing, it's purely wildlife. So we literally pushed the land by a hundred years, like, you know. The first thing I, I remember seeing is uh, in this big Madla village, you know, the first time in 2004, January, it was just about a year after the villages had shifted. So the first time I saw a pair of uh, Malabar Pied Hornbill sitting, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I'd never seen them there, you know, we would see the other side. But that was kind of, uh, you know, I, the, the, the best that I remember, you know, because I saw these two pairs sitting right in the Madla village on a big tree and I said, oh, you know, they've come back. You know, because when people were there, they would raid nests and, you know, uh, most of the fruits that the 
these big birds eat are probably you know taken away by people for as minor forest produce and so on so that was the first then the same year 2004 uh, uh, monsoon you know i visited and i saw elephant dung right in the middle of the village you know so that is something you know like you i mean it, it was not seen then but you know it, it was dung all over you know the roads that were used by these villages were full of dung so that's kind of you know the greatest thing then you know when we started uh, uh, counting animals and so on you know uh, we had done it in 97 before the village has shifted and you know you would come across poachers you know you would hardly see any animals and so on so i think there were about five tigers five plus two cubs seven tigers were uh, you know camera trapped during that time and then you know when we started uh, doing lines we did our first lines after the rehabilitation uh, in uh, 2004 5 so 2005 i i had never seen a sloth bear in the motodi side you know where the villages were there i had never seen in all my life not even seen a, a, a pug you know footmark uh, so the first time in uh, 2005, I actually saw the uh, pad mark, you know, a, a, sloth, a sloth bear had walked on one of the patches. I was, you know, I was initially was shocked. I said, oh my God, you know, where were this, they all these years, you know. So, so that is the coming back. And then we started seeing Chital in the paddy fields, old paddy fields and, you know, then so there were good numbers of sambas, but I mean, again, all of them were in hiding. So then we started seeing animals during the daytime. So, you know, so it was a slow, slow restoration. And, you know, I had seen a lot of areas that had no grass. I mean, I would, I had not even noticed it, you know, because a lot of areas was absolutely without grass. Because there was continuous grazing. There were thousands of cattle going every day in the same area, grazing everything. And, you know, you could see only soil. Today, if you drive, I don't think so, you will see an open patch of soil. It's all covered. So, so that was a big revelation for me. You know, I had some areas where I had never seen grass. I had seen this beautiful cover of grass. And very uh, even, because it's all, it was all grazed by wild animals. So, I think those were the things. You know, some of the huddles, would, you wouldn't find a blade of grass, because it was so neatly grazed by domestic cattle. Because every day they would go to the same place. Wild animals wouldn't do that. So, you know, so those were things that, you know, kind of, you know, gars started coming back. You would see a lot of young ones, multiple age groups of gars, and which was not there because 89 after the big uh, disease, you know, they, they were really struggling to come back. So, then multiple groups of animals and elephants much uh, calmer in some ways. So, those are things that, you know, started restoring uh, our confidence and, uh, you know, we're saying, okay, you know, we are somewhere there and you know when you look at the present tiger numbers it's really kind of you know how a, uh, an area can bounce back we had seven tigers recorded in 97 in, in 2017 they were 40. the flowering of big bamboo in 2004 which happens once in 60 years posed new challenges to madra the lobbies influenced by commercial extraction of bamboo created undue fear among the locals that the forest would burn if the bamboo was not extracted during flowering season. Although the forest department protected the forest for five consecutive years without even a single incidence of fire, the lobbies deliberately set fire to the forest as their commercial interest was not entertained. Unfortunately, this incident burnt over 100 square kilometers of forest. Thanks to the increased protection measures since then, the burnt areas have naturally recovered with new generation of bamboo. When we saw fire, we just became helpless. You know, it was absolutely like you know, the fire is burning. There's no way. It's so big that you know there are five, ten, fifty people can do nothing about it. I knew we'd gone back maybe ten years. We had lost more than thirty, thirty-five thousand acres of land to that ground fire. I knew there would have been. Though it wasn't visible, I knew there would have been a lot of loss of animal life and microhabitats were burnt and microhabitats were destroyed. It was a it was a, it was a time of a lot of despair. But over time, now seeing the same place after 14 years or 13 years, you say, okay, fine, it's coming back. The jungle has come back. You feel good. 
One of the hardest conservation actions anywhere in the world is to stop the ongoing mining operations. The campaigns and legal battles initiated by Wildcat Sea and Padra Wildlife Conservation Trust in the 1990s started gaining momentum. Multiple conservation organizations took lead in the legal battle against Kudremuk mines and Wildcat Sea led the effort against Kemangundi mines. So we understood the repercussions of mining very, very early. The, um, the Kudremuk mines that were going on in one edge of our district was devastating to our district because it, it, it was spoiling the entire Badra catchment area. So where Badra river took birth was getting ruined by the mines that were around that area. So we were trying to object and trying to see and they were running illegally. So we were trying to get them to close down the mines. On the other end, we had Kemangundi where there was mining going on by government agencies, whether it was VISL or SAIL. So we were, we were trying to see whether this was the right place to mine. Now, again, not against uh, metal and not against extracting metal, but where you do it, when you do it, how you do it is very important. So we understood that. We stopped mining in uh, Kemangundi area very, very early because I have a feeling that uh, my personal opinion is that in case we hadn't stopped people from mining in Kemangundi area, our, and there are a lot of estates around here where the, the metal content is pretty high. There were local planters who were privately prospecting for uh, metal content and it is very high. Maybe more and more people would have gotten into mining if we hadn't stopped them is my opinion. So I think mining is one thing that had to be stopped. It was stopped. With the court intervention, both the mining operations were completely closed in 2005 and 2007. Today, it is a delight to see these mined areas being taken over by nature. Considering a proposal made by Wildcat Sea, the state government accorded protection status to these mountains and declared it as Mulangiri Conservation Reserve in 2019. The wildlife corridors of the landscape were also secured, with the state government declaring over 400 square kilometers of forest between Padra Tiger Reserve and Kudremuk National Park as a reserve forest in 2003. These two NGOs, along with other local communities, also saved the landscape from construction of a second reservoir which would have displaced thousands of families and submerged hundreds of square kilometers of forest and coffee plantations. The 53 kilometer long canal proposed for this reservoir would have sliced Badra Tiger Reserve into two halves. They also secured an important elephant corridor from construction of a six lane highway in 2020. This project would have severely fragmented the rainforest of Western Ghats, increased human elephant conflict, and devastated the lives of local communities in landslide prone areas. With these efforts, all three key biodiversity areas of the landscapes and the corridors are secured, and the tiger numbers have increased to 40 in Badra Tiger Reserve. Tigers are also seen dispersing from Badra to other protected areas in the Western Ghats. This landscape is considered as an important and high potential area for tiger population dynamics in the Western Ghats. Increase in tiger numbers is a direct result of securing habitats and a healthy population of prey species. Several species of birds, amphibians, reptiles, innumerable contributors to the biodiversity and water catchment areas were also protected in the process of protecting the top predator. The landscape is currently facing new challenges, but the fact that the important areas have already been secured to support the growing number of tigers gives immense hope for future. This is a story that truly deserves to be celebrated widely. One of the delights of being curator of birds is the chance to visit the bird room here in the University Museum of Zoology. And such visits allow me vicariously to travel the world. In one cabinet, a species from Antarctica. In another drawer, various tiny species from islands in the Hawaiian archipelago. And behind me, waxwings from the boreal forests of Northern Europe. And then there are the species whose stupendous migrations make absolute mincemeat of global distances. And one such is the great shearwater. 
So let's take one out of a drawer. And as you can see, it's quite a large seabird. It weighs eight or nine hundred grams, say a couple of pounds. And I'm sure people are now asking, where do they live? And in fact, virtually all of the five or six million pairs on Earth nest in the Tristan de Cruna group of islands. Think middle of the South Atlantic, halfway between the Cape of Good Hope and the southern tip of South America. So seriously isolated. And in fact, these islands are UK overseas territories. There's just one inhabited island, Tristan de Cunha itself, which is one of the world's most isolated inhabited islands, with about 300 people. Also, some 20 miles to the southwest, the aptly named Inaccessible Island, and also Nightingale Island, the same distance to the southwest of Tristan itself. And there are about 2 million pairs of great shearwaters on each of Nightingale and Inaccessible. When the great shearwaters arrive of an evening, the swarms are matchless. I know that because I've spent nine days on Nightingale. The multitude comes ashore at night to visit their nesting burrows, and then birds take off again before daylight. Generations of birds clambering up boulders to take off have literally scratched furrows in the rocks. And now we're getting to the conservation good news. In November 2020, the joint efforts of the local Tristan community, the UK government, the RSPB, National Geographic, Pristine Seas Project and other NGOs led to the establishment of a 700,000 square kilometre marine reserve with no fishing activity except for some local crayfishing. This reserve not only contains the three islands I've already mentioned, but also Goff Island, which is about 300 kilometres to the south. So good news for the shearwaters, which are always at risk of getting hooked or tangled in nets when large fishing vessels are working in their habitat. Good news too for the critically endangered Tristan Albatross, and for the rockhopper penguins, which are fast declining in numbers. Back now to the great shearwaters, which are terrific travellers. During incubation, they may undertake a loop of, that takes them up to 4,000 kilometres from the colony in 20-day journeys, undertaken while the mate incubates the egg. That loop often takes them to the Patagonian shelf off Argentina, where there still, in fact, remains a need for more protection. And what about when not breeding? The majority of the population journeys to the North Atlantic, migrating north following the North American coast to Canada, and then swinging east towards waters south of Greenland. The bulk of that northward journey from Tristan to Canada is achieved in about 17 days. On the one hand, that is amazing. On the other hand, the daily distance travelled, six, seven hundred kilometres, is not much different to that travelled when off duty during incubation. So all in a day's work for a great shearwater. Then the birds head east across the Atlantic. And at the height of the northern summer, say July, August, large numbers, over a million, are in an area of the North Atlantic, south of Greenland. This is also used at various other times of year by vast numbers of seabirds. Over a million each of black-leaded kittiwakes, little orcs and Atlantic puffins. The importance of this area has only become known thanks to modern tracking technology. Excitingly, this area is now proposed as a Marine Protected Area, or MPA. Fortunately, the initials MPA apply equally to a Marine Protected Area and a massive patch of the Atlantic, in fact a patch of 100,000 square kilometres in extent. If all goes well, the area will be formally designated as the North Atlantic Current and Evelynoff Seamount MPA this coming summer. The designation will be made by a consortium of countries fringing the North Atlantic at the very time of year the great shearwaters are using that area. And the next steps for the shearwaters themselves? to fly south back to Tristan Waters, taking a route mostly to the east of their northbound journey. Again, the journey is rapid, 
three weeks or a little less. For remember, the equatorial waters provide only slim pickings for diving seabirds like the Great Shearwater. And so, next September, the Shearwaters will arrive back in the waters of Tristan de Tuna after a round trip exceeding 30,000 kilometres, much of which has been spent in waters offering them protection. Definite grounds for optimism for the future. Hello, my name is Matt Hayes and I'm a research assistant here at the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. For my conservation success story, I want to talk to you about the large blue butterfly. Because not only does it have a brilliant conservation success story, but it also has an amazing life cycle, which is what got me first interested in the species. So sadly, the original UK population of the large blue butterfly went extinct in 1979, and it had actually been declining for some time. This decline triggered research into better understanding its life cycle and requirements, but this improved understanding came a few years too late for the original UK population. But a few years later, we were able to successfully reintroduce the species from Sweden, and now we have some of the densest population of this species anywhere in the world. So it's a really good success story because it went from being locally extinct to now being back in the country in really good numbers. The start of the life cycle of the large blue butterfly is not that strange, at least not for a butterfly. The fertile adult female will lay her eggs on a specific food plant, and that food plant for the large blue is wild thyme. And after about a week, the egg hatches and a tiny caterpillar emerges. It then spends about two weeks feeding on its food plant, but it doesn't do much growing. And then it does something really quite weird and quite extraordinary. It falls off its food plant to the floor and for most species that would be a terrible idea because you would obviously be away from your food and you would starve. But what then happens is that worker ants come across the caterpillar, pick it up, adopt it and take it back to their nest. What it turns out happens is that the caterpillar of the large blue butterfly mimics the ants. So it has chemicals on its cuticle, so its hard outer skin, that match or very similar to the chemicals on the hard outer skin of the ant. And the caterpillar also mimics the sound of a queen ant to raise its status as well. So what happens is it tricks the worker ants into thinking that they've actually come across one of their own young. And they think it's escaped the nest, so they pick it up, adopt it, take it back to the nest, and they protect it. The large blue butterfly's caterpillar is then a terrible guest because it proceeds to eat the real young of the ant. So it actually gorges itself and it can grow to be about 20 times the size as when it was first adopted. And it gets to be way bigger than the ants that did adopt it. But all the while the ants are none the wiser, they just think one of their offspring is doing really, really well whilst the others are disappearing, so they continue to look after it. After about nine months of feeding, the large blue butterfly's caterpillar pupates, and a month or two later, the uh, adult butterfly emerges from the chrysalis and emerges out of an ant's nest. So obviously this is an amazing behaviour and I don't think most people who see a butterfly in the countryside would think it's undertaking this social parasitic behaviour, kind of like a cuckoo bird, but it is. It's really quite fascinating. And we think the reason for its original decline and extinction in the UK is that we didn't fully understand how complicated and specific this interaction with ants is. So in the UK it's only one species that usually adopts caterpillars of the large blue butterfly. It's a red ant called Mimica sabuleti, and this species relies on warm, bare ground to survive and not be outcompeted by other ant species. We think maybe from the 1950s onwards there was a cessation of traditional cattle grazing and also myxomatosis in the UK wiped out a lot of our rabbit populations, and this meant that grass all over the country could just grow up by a few centimetres and shade the ground and cool it. This cooled the ground enough so that it was unsuitable for the host ant of the large blue butterfly. Other ants came in and outcompeted it. Without the host ant, the butterfly that they support can not be supported either, and it's thought that's why the large blue butterfly went extinct in the UK. Since reintroduction from Sweden, though, and since it was reintroduced into Somerset and that area of uh, this country, 
We have put in place management plans that undertake grazing and mowing regimes to keep the sward, keep the grass really short. If the grass is short, they don't shade out the ground and it's kept nice and warm for the host ant. And if the host ant is thriving, so too can the large blue butterfly. We think that's why it's now doing really, really well. I love this example of uh, the large blue butterfly as a conservation success story because it gives a really good idea of how if we put the time and effort in to doing the research and understanding the requirements of a species, we can make reintroductions and conservation management plans work. And it's also a brilliant example of how interconnected the natural world is and these really impressive and perhaps unexpected interactions that go on between the species all around us. I might be biased, but albatrosses are some of the most stunning and awe-inspiring birds on this planet. But they're also among the most threatened. 15 of 22 species are at risk from extinction, and that's largely because of incidental capture in fisheries, also known as bycatch. This happens when birds try to snatch baits from longline hooks and get caught and dragged under, and also when their big wings whack off the thick steel cables behind vessels, break them, and stop them from flying and foraging effectively. Fortunately, there are simple solutions to this problem. And back in 2005, BirdLife International and the RSPB established the Albatross Task Force to work directly with the fishing industry to help demonstrate and implement these measures in some of the most important places for bycatch in the world. One such place was Namibia where the Bengala current brings huge marine productivity that both fishing fleets and albatrosses exploit. And when you get that combination, very often there's lots of bycatch. This year, the ATF team have published a scientific paper which shows the introduction of regulations making bird scaring lines mandatory. This has resulted in a 98% reduction in seabird bycatch in the Namibian longline hake fishery. We have also seen a reduction in the troll fishery, however, it shows that some more work needs to be done to ensure that the bird scaring lines are being used correctly. Some of this work um, involves installing extension arms on the fishing vessels to allow a more effective way of using the bird scaring lines during fishing operations. These are some of the ways in which the ATF is looking in supporting fisheries management in Namibia and have also contributed to the MSC certification for the Hague fishery. So what's next for the ATF? We're looking at training of the trainer programs and working closely with the observer agency and inspectors to ensure that seabird bycatch reductions are sustained long into the future. This includes hardwiring seabird safe fishing into the way that the fishing industry operates and also in which the data are collected. I am proud of the work that my team and I have been able to accomplish uh, working alongside the government, the inspectorate and the observer agency. There is still a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of conservation in, in Namibia. However, we have proved that it's possible and we look forward to many more successes in our marine space. Many of the birds previously caught in Namibian waters breed on an island called South Georgia in the subantarctic, where I worked as a seabird researcher. I witnessed firsthand the devastating impacts of bycatch, removing fishing hooks from birds and seeing the increasing number of empty nests every year. This amazing achievement in Namibia as a result of the important work by the Albatross Task Force and the Namibian government gives me huge hope for the future of South Georgia seabirds. What we need to see next is other countries learning from the success of Namibia and working with their own fishing industries to make bycatch a thing of the past so that seabirds can start thriving again.